Hi, everyone. I'm Jack Cush. I'm here at UR 2022 in Copenhagen. Uh, and I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Sophia Romero. Sophia is um, well known in the field of spondyloarthritis. She comes to us from Leiden University Medical Center in the Netherlands. Good afternoon, Sophia. Good afternoon, uh, Jack. Okay, so we're going to talk about the new um, ASAS um, ULAR guidelines on AXPA. Um, how did you get interested in AXPA? Well, AXPA has been my focus of uh, research in the last 10 years. If I'm very honest with you, it's ended up on my plate because my supervisors uh, uh, decided that that would be my PhD topic, but I'm very thankful to that opportunity because nowadays it's really what I'm mostly interested uh, in and what I'm fascinated about. I think it, there's so much that we don't know yet that uh, I, I really, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious about investigating it further. Well, we certainly need more people like you. I've been following you at past ACRs and ULARs. I love your research. I love your interest. Um, we asked you here to talk about these new guidelines. T uh, take us through the process of how these guidelines came to be. Sure. So in 2016, we issued the last version of the, this recommendation. So also a share, shared recommendations between others in ULAR. And since then, a lot of evidence has accumulated. So there's more, there was more evidence on new drugs with new modes of action and also a tree to target trial that had been conducted. So we thought it was the moment to conduct an update. So we, we gathered again a task force and again, a joint project between Aziz and Euler. We conducted this task force and we got uh, into this uh, management uh, recommendations and to this update of 2022 of the AXPA management recommendations. Uh, we were 33 members uh, involved and more than half of the members were new compared to the, new ver to the last version. So we, we think that's also good because we are bringing press fresh blood into the, the group and and then um, and that's how we 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 uh, due to covid we had to have an online meeting it was cha challenging but it was very fruitful and productive and i i think we are all very proud of what uh, the end product of these recommendations is okay so as usually the case in these kind of guy uh, new guidelines and recommendations there are overarching principles and then key recommendations any of those that you want to highlight for us? Yeah, definitely. So uh, in total, we have, you're totally right, we have five uh, overarching principles and we have 15 recommendations. I would like to emphasize this, uh, that these are recommendations over the entire spectrum of actual SPA, so uh, including non-radiographic and radiographic actual SPA. It's also recommendations on both non-pharmacological and pharmacological treatment. And although I have more to tell about pharmacological treatment, because those are mostly the recommendations that have been updated, because that's the area in which there have, have been more updates, I would like to emphasize the importance of non-pharmacological treatment. In this, this is cross-sectional to many diseases, but I would say that in actual SPA, this is particularly important. And the task force emphasized that again. And on NSAIDs remain the first line of pharmacological uh, treatment. And as before, we have criteria to start biological DMARTs. At this time, also targeted synthetic DMARTs were added. So now the criteria are to start either a biologic or a targeted synthetic DMART. And the, what, what changed most is that now we have the ASDAS uh, disease activity criterion as the the criterion to select patients to include or to start treatment with biological or targeted synthetic DMARTs. So an ASDAS of 2.1 is the criterion uh, to identify patients with high disease activity uh, because of the accumulated uh, superiority of the ASDAS towards uh, the BASDAI. In the last version of the recommendations, we had both uh, either the ASDAS criterion or the BASDAI criterion. In this uh, recommendations, the task force decided based on the accumulated evidence to, to make the choice for the criterion that has shown the best performance. So an ASAS of at least 2.1 is the criterion to decide upon a high disease activity for eligibility of biological or targeted synthetic DMARTs. And then we have the, the indication for, for treatment. So we uh, the task force uh, uh, indicated or, or recommended that when, when there is the indication for treatment, uh, any of the drug classes can be started. So either TNF inhibitors, IL-17 inhibitors, or JAK inhibitors. 
uh, JAK inhibitors are a new drug class, a new mode of action in actual SPA compared to the previous version of the recommendations. And due to accumulated evidence and safety and data and experience with mainly TNF inhibitors, but also IL-17 inhibitors, the task force emphasized that current practice, although any of the drug classes can be started, current practice is to start either a TNF inhibitor or an IL-17 inhibitor. Uh, then furthermore, we have a new recommendation emphasizing the importance of extra musculoskeletal manifestations. So UVI, it is IBD or psoriasis, as this often guides a therapeutic decision, and we have data on that. So therefore, in the presence of recurrent uveitis or IBD, uh, the task force recommends to give preference to TNF monoclonal antibodies. And when patient has significant psoriasis, then an IL-17 inhibitor should be preferred. There's also another new recommendation focusing on uh, treatment failure because this is something that uh, is common and we see in daily clinical practice. And whenever we see treatment failure, the task force is of the opinion that that should trigger a reevaluation of the diagnosis of the patient. So really uh, reconsider whether the diagnosis is the correct one, whether the patient really has actual SPA, and also consider whether there, are, there is the presence of comorbidities that are influencing the assessment of the disease activity and also outcomes of the disease and treatment outcomes. So this is important uh, to consider. And when active uh, actual SPA is confirmed, then indeed a switch to another biological or targeted synthetic DMARDs is recommended. And here, due to the lack of data uh, in, in what concerns switches between the different modes of action, we only have trials with patients failing IL-17 inhibitors, sorry, failing TNF inhibitors and getting IL-17 inhibitors. We do not have trials with patients switching between the other drug uh, modes of drugs from the other modes of action, but the task force decided that any switch would be uh, recommended. And lastly, when patients are in sustained remission, tapering uh, should be considered, and this is tapering of biological DMARDs because there is absolutely no data on tapering of targeted synthetic DMARDs, we decided to not make a recommendation or to not expand the recommendation uh, to that. And I think this is uh, the focus are of the recommendations that were mostly updated or actually two uh, totally new recommendations as I indicated to you. So you, I like that these are updated from 2016 that you focus in on the as that's disease activity measure as an indication for these advanced therapies. Has that yet become a standard in routine practice in Europe that, that to start a new biologic or targeted synthetic, you really have to show evidence of that greater than 2.1? Um, just for clinical trials. No, it has, become, uh, it has become practice. And as I said, in the previous version of the recommendations, we had uh, the, the recommendation that to start biological DMARDs, at that time we did not have targeted synthetic DMARDs, we would need either an ASLAS above 2.1 or a BASDA above uh, uh, equal or above 4. And so at that moment, any of the two was recommended, and this is daily clinical practice. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean everyone does, does it, but it's highly recommended. And what I see and what we see in the last 10 years is that not only disease activity is increasingly more measured, but also ASLAS is becoming more and more used in daily clinical practice. So I think this is uh, implementation has, has certainly started, is ongoing, can always be improved. And I also think that these recommendations can uh, give some help on that because if we clearly recommend which is the best disease activity measure to use in daily clinical practice and which is the best to use to make a selection and of, on the eligibility of patients for treatment, then I think we are also giving a clear message to clinicians that this is the, the measure that needs to be assessed in daily clinical practice. Do the ACES-UR guidelines address treat to target? Um, yes. There is a recommendation on that was unchanged. I didn't mention it, that there is a recommendation that uh, there uh, should be, it is recommended that there is a treatment target. It is on purpose formulated on somewhat vague and not specific because there is no agreement on which target there should be and how we should treat to target or not. We are, of course, aware of the TICOSPA, the only trial, treat to target trial that exists in actual SPA. 
which is a trial that has, is, is challenging in, ter in, interpreting, in interpreting it because its primary and, uh, endpoint was not man, met. So that means that formally it's a negative trial. It was 30% improvement in the ASAS health index. But if we look at disease activity uh, endpoints, several of them were met. And those were the endpoints that were used in other treat to target uh, trials in, in other diseases. So it's quite challenging to take definite conclusions on treat to target in actual SPA. But the bottom line is some treat to target principles apply, probably not thoroughly measuring it and, and blindly uh, in, uh, escalating treatment whenever uh, an ASDAS or a target is not met, but uh, it's good to keep it in mind and it's good to have a, a treatment target agreed with the patient. That is what our recommendations state. Um, what do you, are, is there a role for imaging in these guidelines as far as guiding the therapies or choice of therapies? Uh, as these are uh, treatment recommendations and not, so they would, the question would only be in terms of the uh, uh, choice of therapies, guiding therapies, and for the eligibility of uh, treatment with biological or targeted synthetic DMARTs, I did not mention that because that's unchanged compared to the previous recommendations, but patients should have either elevated uh, CRP and or a positive imaging, a positive MRI of the sacroiliac joints. Uh, and or patients being uh, having radiographic sacroiliitis, so patients having uh, radiographic actual SPA or, or uh, ankylosing spondylitis. The last one is for historical reasons, because uh, trials have been first conducted and, and drugs have been approved only in, in radiographic actual SPA and in non-radiographic actual SPA particularly, but this also applies to radiographic actual SPA. We know that if patients have either an elevated CRP and or a positive MRI of the sacroiliac joints, they have a higher likelihood of response to treatment. And that's why these are criteria for eligibility of patients to treatment. I like that the uh, guidelines address the extra uh, spinal manifestations of the disease. That's really important to those who treat this. Do, do they also address comorbidity other than to say it's something you need to be aware of? That's an overarching principle on the one hand, uh, that the, uh, the whole spectrum of the patient, including comorbidities, should be uh, taken care of and should be considered, as you mentioned. The other recommendation, that is the new recommendation that I mentioned, when there is a failure to treatment, then there is the new recommendation to reconsider whether the diagnosis is correct. And if yes, whether it, there could be the presence of comorbidities that are justifying or that are contributing to justify the patient not meeting uh, a good response or not achieving a good response to treatment, then that should be eventually considered when assessing the disease or, or, or assessing treatment outcomes. So we don't have a clear or a specific recommendations on how to approach specific comorbidities, but not only to be aware of them, but specifically in, in when there is treatment failure to uh, proactively look for comorbidities that can be in the source of this and can justify this. Well, I think that these guidelines are a big step forward. We'll look forward not only to the presentation um, today, but also the, the uh, publication of the paper. So, Sophia, thank you so much for your time. Enjoy the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jack. You too. Thank you.